starts right now. Inoltre faccio nuovamente appello I appeal once again that access to humanitarian aid be ensured to Gaza and call once more for the prompt release of the hostages seized on the 7th of October and for an immediate ceasefire in the Strip. That was just part of the message Pope Francis rallied to give at this morning's Easter Mass. The 87-year-old presided over the service in a flower-decked St. Peter's Square, delivering his yearly prayer for peace to thousands watching in person and around the globe. Pope Francis isn't alone in his prayers for peace on this day of reflection and hope. Thousands of Christians right here in San Antonio headed to church today to remember the resurrection. Our Daniela Ibarra went to an Easter Mass to find out what some parishioners are praying for this year. At the San Fernando Cathedral, and you can see your salvation. The pews are filled with fellowship and faith. Uh, just the love of God. For me, it's just all his accomplishments, you know, besides dying on the cross for us, so, and bringing people together. This Easter season, so many are strengthened by unity. Just be, mainly being with friends and family and just being able to celebrate together. I feel the family and the, the beliefs needs to be more a uh, race again into the families and into the young people. The messages of joy and grace sinking into people's minds and spirits. It's pretty much everything I wanted to hear right now. The Holy Holiday, a time for reflection far beyond home. For peace and the war. Hope blooms for peace in places of war. Look at the war right now. Ukraine, Israel. A lot of a lot of problems, no? Despite the devastation, Easter gives people a sense of renewal and devotion. And I hope so everything this stop. Yeah. Pray for everybody. Danielle Ibarra. KSAT 12 News. Thank you for that message, Daniela. I guess if you did head out for any services today or even any egg hunts, the biggest thing that you noticed in the weather department was the humidity. That was there today and it's not going anywhere tonight or even as we look ahead to our Monday. No April Fool's joke here. It is going to be a muggy start first thing tomorrow morning. Mid to upper 60s in stores. You're stepping out for the morning drive and also some areas of patchy fog and mist once again are expected, but I do anticipate a few peaks of sunshine into the afternoon. Check out what that could do to our high temperatures, upper 80s, even approaching that 90 degree mark possible here in the Alamo City. So it's going to get a bit warmer before it gets a little cooler. By the way, tomorrow evening there also is a brief window for a few isolated to maybe widely separated showers and thunderstorms. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Tuesday, we'll see our cold front move in early, early in the morning. That's going to allow for some lower humidity to push back in. And then after that, cooler mornings and some nice afternoons are, are in store through the remainder of the work week. So we'll break that down for you. Plus, even later in the newscast, get you a little bit more information and the countdown to that total solar eclipse, which is now happening next week. Courtney. Yeah, I cannot believe it's just a week away from that solar eclipse. South Texas has a front row seat. That's why KSAT has you covered for everything you need to know about the big day, including how you should prepare before and then after the eclipse. And right now on KSAT.com, head to the Eclipse Authority tab for a list of events leading up to April 8th. You can also check out an interactive map. So cool. You have to look at it. It shows the complete path of the eclipse and specifically where you are. So just look at this article. Moving on, some people living in Bear County are taking action in their own backyards after the largest wildfire in Texas history scorched through a million acres in the Panhandle. It's been two weeks since the Smokehouse Creek fire has been completely contained. As the night team's Avery Everett shows us, people living closer to home are using that disaster as a warning sign to limit the chances of a fire sparking here. With a forest this full, Charlie Lewis says it's hard not to think what a wildfire could do here. It's prime uh, fuel for wildfire. 
He lives in the Cibolo Canyons community, and in this part of North Bear County, there's an abundance of trees and brush. This area is has yet to be cut, but it's on the list. Yes. Their concern is that if a wildfire happened here, it could easily spread, but that soon could change with the FireWise community. Neighborhoods can uh, take control of uh, their communities and make them fire safe. The FireWise USA program gives people the tools to minimize the spread of potential wildfires. You can do these wildfire prevention efforts in your own backyard. The Texas A&M Forest Service splits this space into three different zones. The first one is the immediate zone right by your house. They ask that you keep your roof and gutters clean and that if you have any damaged shingles, that you make sure that they are replaced. The second zone is this intermediate space. That's where we're standing right now. It's anywhere from five feet to 30 feet away from your house. In this space, they ask that you keep your grass cut pretty low and that if you're planning on planting any trees or shrubs, that you spread them out. The third and final zone is the extended zone, and this could be pretty expansive. They ask that you keep an eye out for any debris or dead tree material, and that's what those FireWise communities say they're trying to tackle. The idea of creating these zones uh, is to slow down the wildfire, to give the fire department a chance to get ahead of the wildfire. And while this FireWise community has been around for a couple of seasons, their new focus this spring is saving native plants. And preserving the forest, by getting rid of fuel for wildfire, we also want to promote and protect the good in the forest. They say many native plants have adapted to fires, and they also say they're essential to a healthy forest. They've created a list and labeled them too. Cedar elm tree, a gum bully shrub, never heard of that actually. This is just one neighborhood now, but they're looking to take their efforts across the county. It matters everywhere. Hoping Bear County can be better prepared if a wildfire breaks out. Avery Everett, KSAT 12 News. It has been 29 years today since Selena Quintanilla Perez's life and career were cut short. In 1995, she was shot and killed in Corpus Christi. Selena was just 23 years old. Despite her death, fans have kept the Queen of Tejano's legacy alive. Her killer, Yolanda Saldivar, is serving a life sentence. But records from the Texas Department of Criminal Justice show she's eligible for parole next March. Back here at home, a man being accused of domestic violence took off with his daughter after allegedly attacking a man with a machete. This happened just after two this morning in the 1200 block of Bandera Road on the northwest side. Police say the suspect and the woman at the home share that daughter. They say the suspect walked in to find the woman in the home with another man. The woman says the suspect then picked up a machete, threatened to kill her, and then attacked that other man, cutting his hands. The preliminary information police gave us said, quote, the suspect left the location and took his daughter with him. Now, we've asked police if that child is in danger or if they know where she is right now, but we haven't received an answer. All we know is that CSI has taken over this investigation. And of course, we will keep tabs and update you as soon as we get that information. Also, if you or someone you know is in an abusive relationship, we always have a long list of resources for you. You can scan the QR code right there on your screen or visit ksat.com slash domestic violence. Well, San Antonio police detained two teens after a late night gun sale turned deadly. Shots were fired near the 100 block of Chaucer Avenue before 11 o'clock last night. Police found a 36 year old man in the street that had been shot. They say before the man was rushed to the hospital, he told police he was shot trying to buy a gun and then he died at that hospital. Police tracked down a 16 year old and 18 year old who they say could have been involved, but they don't know which one may have pulled the trigger. To Baltimore now, where crews are still working around the clock to remove the steel and concrete from the fallen Francis Scott Key Bridge that collapsed into the water just five days ago. Cranes and workers measured and cut steel in preparation to lift sections out of the water. At the same time, salvage divers are going under the surface of the site to support those operations. It's a meticulous process, all in an effort to get that waterway back up and running as soon and as safely as possible. We have to be smart. We've got to be safe. We have to make sure we're protecting these first responders and these people who are working on it. Uh, and at the same time, we have to move with a measurement of speed because we have got to get this channel open. Meanwhile, recovery crews are still desperately trying to find the last of four road workers who died after the bridge collapsed. 
Yesterday, we told you about that massive AT&T cell service data breach. Millions of customers, current and former, may have had their sensitive personal information leaked. It's a story we are going to keep following. So for a complete breakdown of the leak, AT&T's response, and to help you find if you are affected, just scan the QR code on your screen. Well, you know it's there when you need it, but do you know how it works? What happens when you call 911? In a new Case That Explains episode, we're taking you inside a local emergency communication center. Think of it like a command center for emergencies happening all across our area. And a fee on your phone bill pays for this. We talked with both dispatchers and call takers to share what it's like to answer these calls day in and day out. While she was on the phone, you heard the gun go off. Um, you heard her scream. Some of the emergencies they deal with, they never forget. We walk you through what happens from the time a 911 call or text is answered and how your monthly fee funds it. KSAT Explains is at 1030. Well, two Easter weekend shootings are making headlines across the country. Everything we know about those situations, next on The Night Beat. In your Nightbeat News Flash, seven children ranging in age from 12 to 17 were hurt in a shooting late last night in downtown Indianapolis. Officers were patrolling nearby when they heard those gunshots. They found a big group of kids at the scene. Six of them had been shot, and then a seventh child later arrived at the hospital. Thankfully, all of them are in stable condition. As for who fired the gun, no arrests have been made, and it's unclear if there was more than one shooter. Now to Nashville, where law enforcement is looking for the shooter who killed one person and hurt five more in a coffee shop this morning. Those, shops rang, those shots rang out during an Easter brunch inside that shop. Nashville's ABC station WKRN reports Metro Nashville police say the shooting stemmed from an argument between two men in the shop. Those other five victims were just caught in the crossfire. A few other people were also hurt trying to escape the coffee shop. And in South Carolina, convicted killer Alec Murdoch will be sentenced for nearly two dozen financial crimes tomorrow. The former attorney is already serving two life sentences for the 2021 murders of his wife and son. Murdoch admitted to stealing money from his clients and law firm and has pleaded guilty to the crimes in state court. As for sentencing tomorrow, the presiding federal judge could rescind the plea deal Murdoch reached after prosecutors say he lied on a polygraph test and broke the terms of that plea deal. And that's your look at your nightly flash. Around America, more than 20 million people in Southern California are under flood watches this weekend. Heavy rains, flooded roads, downed trees, and complicated travel. ABC's Allison Kosick tells us where that same system is heading next. Heavy rain on Highway 101 in Southern California made for difficult travel conditions. This car spitting out moments later, a second car crashing into it. Thankfully, no major injuries were reported. In Long Beach, the rain and gusty winds brought down this eucalyptus tree, collapsing on a home with a mother and her son inside. Neither was injured. And near Big Sur, parts of Highway 1 were forced to close after a 10-foot section of the southbound lane collapsed into the ocean. Back in January, hundreds of homes were damaged by flooding in this San Diego neighborhood. This weekend's heavy rains have residents worried. We're traumatized because uh, when we see this kind of rain, it feels like it's going to happen again. In the San Bernardino Mountains, snow and high winds making for treacherous driving conditions. Numerous vehicles stranded, drivers trying to dig out. That same system is now moving east. On Monday, severe thunderstorms possible from Texas to Ohio, bringing potentially damaging wind gusts, large hail and possible tornadoes. Our attention turns to the middle of the country as the system slides a severe thunderstorm threat to the heartland. Cities like Dallas, Tulsa and St. Louis on alert for a potential severe weather outbreak it's going to be a rough start to the work week for so many. Later Monday evening and into Tuesday morning, flash flooding is possible amid heavy rains in parts of the Midwest and Ohio River Valley. Flood watch is in effect from Indiana to West Virginia. Allison Kosick, ABC News, New York. Gosh, feeling for those people on Easter weekend Seriously. dealing with all kinds of crazy weather. We were lucky. All we had was some humidity. <laughs> yeah. but, but that's what the question was. Is that 
front going to affect us? Right. Essentially, is that system yeah. going to bring us any changes mm -hmm. here in South Central Texas? And the short answer okay. is yes, a few yeah. changes, mainly in the form of that front that's going to move in tomorrow night and mm -hmm. early Tuesday morning. And ahead of that boundary, yes, there will be a brief window, mainly after 8 to 9 p.m. tomorrow, where we could see a few widely separated showers and thunderstorms. Sure, one or two of which could potentially sit on the stronger side. So I want to walk you through it, talk about it, and really the changes that we're going to be seeing throughout the upcoming work week. We still got the humidity in place right now. Dew points, how we measure the low level moisture here in the atmosphere in the upper 60s, very much in that muggy category, and that's not going anywhere as we look ahead to the first day of April tomorrow. So plan for a muggy feel, but after that front moves in tomorrow night and early Tuesday morning, it's going to sweep out all of that mugginess and dry air moves in in its wake. So more of a comfortable feel is in store by by Tuesday and even some cooler mornings as we head into the middle of the week time frame, which of course we'll talk about in just a second as well. But first, here's a look at your case at 12 hour forecast planning out the day tomorrow. As we were mentioning a little bit earlier, because of that humidity, another round of morning cloud cover as well as some patchy fog and mist is expected to greet you out the door for the Monday morning drive. Some of those visibilities could be a little bit lower, so not a bad idea to give yourself a little bit of extra time to get to where you need to be. Temperature wise, yes, very humid start 68 degrees at 7 a.m. at lunchtime. Still expecting the cloud cover, but temperature should be able to warm a little bit more efficiently tomorrow compared to what we saw out there earlier today. 77 the forecast temperature at noon. I do expect a few peaks of sunshine into the afternoon and look at how your high temperatures respond. Hotter than average tomorrow, upper 80s, even approaching that 90 degree mark here in the Alamo city also could be a little breezy at times winds generally out of the south to southeast at about 10 to 15 miles per hour. Then we monitor that brief window for a few thunderstorms. So let's talk about that setup again. Nothing out there in terms of notable rain right now, just the cloud cover in place, but that is a different story across portions of the Rockies, even the desert southwest. We've got some rain and some snow where temperatures are cold enough in the higher elevations. No snow for us, but you can see that low pressure system that is moving across the Rockies. That's going to be tracking eastward here over the next 12 hours by about 11 a.m. tomorrow. It's approaching the Texas Panhandle and the Central Plains. It's then going to drop that front into West Texas. It's going to approach our area tomorrow night. Notice by 9 p.m., especially west of the I-35 corridor for places like Kerrville, Bandera, even Lakey. That's we may need to monitor for a broken line of rain and thunderstorms to start progressing eastward across our area. Depending on the coverage of that, we potentially could see a few thunderstorms move in to the San Antonio area by about 11 p.m. That will continue on into midnight, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. But then notice by the time we're waking up first thing Tuesday morning, that is out of our area, already seeing plenty of sunshine return. That drier air is going to move in into Tuesday as well via a breezy north wind. And we did mention there is the potential. It's the exception rather than the rule here, but the potential to make Maybe see an isolated storm sit on the strong to briefly severe side. The higher threat for that is across the Midwest and even the Central Plains near Oklahoma City and St. Louis. But just know it's something we will continue to monitor for you tomorrow night. Definitely keep those notifications on on your KSAT Weather Authority app. Until then, 74 degrees right now, a dew point of 68 in town. Yes, it will be a humid start tomorrow. Hot into the afternoon, nearing 90 degrees. We'll monitor for that brief window for a few storms. Then after that, Courtney, take a look at those morning lows yes. by Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Cooler, you will want the light jacket near 50, maybe some upper 40s. Very comfortable high temperatures. So once again, we'll have another look at your forecast coming up in the next half hour. More on the eclipse and also March recap now that we are rounding out the month. Which has been a roller coaster. It Just sure take a look has. at this week and you can tell. All right, thank you so much, Mia. We'll be right back with a preview of Instant Replay. Spring football has a completely different ring to it after the USFL XFL merger. Mary Rominger joins us in the studio for a preview of what's on Instant Replay. It's such a cool merger because 
every it's bringing in fans together. Absolutely. Yeah. There's only there's only room for one spring football <laughs> right. league, in my opinion. And the UFL boasts a lot of talent across the league's eight teams. And it showed this afternoon in the Alamo Dome when the San Antonio Brahmas opened their season against the DC Defenders. Hey, this young man. Hey, your boy spit on me again. It's over. You spit on me again. It's over. Yes, get your boy. There was a lot of drama in today's Brahma season opener, but two actions by the same man on the same play completely changed the course of the game. We'll have the highlights, and Nick Mantis has more on the home opener in the Alamo Dome. McBride. Spurs win in overtime. Can you believe that one move you just saw Spurs cost Spurs rookie Victor Wembanyama $25,000. It was the fine that got handed down this morning as the Spurs were getting ready for game day against the Golden State Warriors. Highlights and post are coming up. We didn't we didn't win though. That was the overall goal coming into this tournament. I it's hard. And in just two days, both Baylor and Texas were eliminated in the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament. Who is still alive? We'll update you on the March Madness brackets between the men and women. And SAFC went undefeated in the month of March. Major League Baseball wraps up their first weekend of the season. And should the Dallas Cowboys bring back former running back Ezekiel Elliott? That's our poll question tonight. So start voting right now. Instant replay starts at the top of the hour, Courtney. That's a controversial one. Yes, it, it is. be an interesting poll. Yes. All right. Thanks, Mary. We'll be right back with more news and weather after this. It's the number you're supposed to call during an emergency, 911. But who picks up? And did you know that you pay a fee for that service every time you pay your phone bill? KSAT explains what happens when you call or text 911. San Antonio 911, this is Jennifer. Do you need police, fire, or EMS? My name is Jennifer Rodriguez. I am a communications call taker. I receive 911 calls and non-emergency calls. This is the Bear Metro Emergency Communication Center. Was he an older male, a younger male? Also known as a PSAP. It's a primary safety uh, answering point. Here, information is always changing. Calls filled with chaos and concern come in by the second. May I have a description of the vehicle? In this room are call takers for the Bear County Sheriff's Office and the San Antonio Police Department. People's lives initially depend on what we do here. When someone calls or texts 911, a call taker answers it and immediately asks, Do you need police, fire, or EMS? If there is a fire or someone needs an ambulance, We don't ask any questions first. We get fire on the line immediately. The call is transferred to San Antonio Fire Department dispatchers who are located in this same room. Call takers like Jennifer stay on the line to see if police are needed. May I please have a good contact number for you? When an officer does need to respond, call takers get as much information as they can. The questions they ask are often similar, but what's on the other end can be wildly different. And some of those calls, they never forget. I encountered a call where this um, wife called. Her husband had um, just shot himself in the head. He had initially said he was going to do it. She was calling for help, for mental health. And while she was on the phone, you heard the gun go off. Um, you heard her scream. To hear what was going on in her screams, those things never never come out of your head. You can't help but feel the pain that the person who's calling is going through. But that pain comes with a purpose. A call taker's job is to put the info a caller gives them into what's called a key card and pass that call on to a San Antonio police dispatcher like Kristen Rodriguez. The dispatcher will read the key card and prioritize it whether it be a code one, code two, code three response. It could be a robbery in progress, a shooting in progress, a rape in progress. Those type of calls, of course, they're code three and they're our number one priority to get officers out there. Dispatchers work with calls that are divided according to SAPD substations. They dispatch officers that work out of those substations based on where the caller's emergency is located. Watch what happened during our interview. If there's an officer in that district or that section that can go to 
Go ahead. I'm sorry. I got it, Raul. Anyone that can break away, any safe officers. It's a shooting with a hit. Said it's a 16 year old male that was shot in the hand. There's a second call, daughter, 16 year old boyfriend shot himself in the hand on purpose. All officers use caution. 10 4, I have you in route. You know, do I send. Do I send two officers? Do I send three officers? The hardest part is knowing that you're in charge of all these lives and, you know, that one time you don't send cover could cost or potentially cost, you know, an officer's life. The call center is operated by Bear Metro. Despite the name, it is not a division of Bear County. It's the local 911 district. There are districts like that all across the state. Bear Metro's area includes Bear, Comal, and Guadalupe counties. And our primary job is to provide the resources is necessary for the 911 system to work from the time a caller um, dials 911 to the time a call taker receives the call. Bear Metro provides the technology and the equipment. The 40 cities within the Bear Metro 911 district provide the call takers, the dispatchers, and the response. Your tax dollars pay for the work of your local police and fire departments, but a fee on your phone bill pays for the 911 technology used here. The 50 cent 911 fee that you see in your wireless bills are all wireless numbers have a 50 cent uh, 911 fee that is um, collected by the state comptroller and then divided out accordingly. There's also a 50 cent fee applied to residential landlines and VoIP lines. That's when you use an internet connection to make calls. For business lines, the fee is $1. Bear Metro works with an annual budget of around $18 million. That provides the 911 technology for the 23 emergency communication centers across Bear, Guadalupe, and Comal counties. In San Antonio, there are two, one on the north side and south side. They're redundant to each other, so if one, one facility goes down, we've got the other as a backup. If something catastrophic were to happen and both uh, facilities were down as far as our phones or CAD systems, then we partner with Austin PD. And so they would take our overflow, they'd take our 911 calls. Someone has to be there to answer the call. For Jennifer, those calls have become her calling, no matter what she finds on the other end. I've actually taken up knitting or, or crocheting, and on my break or on my lunch, I'll take a walk outside and I I know this is a religious talk, but I talk to God or I knit or I crochet and I have blankets that I make here. You, you find ways to cope, but I wouldn't see myself doing anything else. I really wouldn't. And it takes a special person. We appreciate them who do that job. We have a lot of interesting Case That Explains episodes. You can check out all of our coverage by scanning this QR code on your screen. And if there's something that you would like explained, let us know right now on KSAT.com. All right, switching gears and heading back outside with live cam. Yes, the cloud cover in place. Temperatures still muggy out there, gradually falling through the 70s late this Sunday night. It was a warmer than average Easter Sunday across the board. 64 was the low temperature, nine degrees above the average low of 55. Our high 79, two degrees above the average of 77, 93 and 31 are the records set back in 1929 and 1987 respectively. Much like what we saw yesterday, how high those thermometers were able to climb across the area very dependent on who saw the sunshine a little bit earlier in the day. That was especially out closer to the Rio Grande. 97 was the high in Del Rio, 95 in Carrizo Springs, 81 in Gonzales, 77 in Kerrville. Here in the Alamo City, we could potentially near that 90 degree mark tomorrow afternoon. Then we see our next cold front move in tomorrow night, early Tuesday. That knocks us back down into the 70s by Wednesday, Thursday and into Friday with some cooler mornings as well. So we'll have another look at that extended forecast coming up in just a bit. All right, thanks, Mia. Well, apparently Gen Z and millennials are getting cold feet when it comes to getting therapy. What's stopping them? Next on the Night Beat. New statistics show 93% of Gen Z and millennials want to improve their mental health this year, but 22% don't think it'll happen. Producer Haley Powers explains why they think it's difficult to find a therapist. I'm in therapy. I need help. These words are hard for many people to say. The stigma of seeking therapy is decreasing, but it's still out there, and a lot of people are afraid to admit they might need help. 
The Thriving Center of Psychology released a new report about Gen Z and millennials. It shows the top three reasons these groups are seeking therapy, including anxiety, depression, and stress. We don't have the access to homes. We're not moving out at 18 and then just getting our lives started. Um, we're not all getting married in our early 20s. And then you add all the political strife, you add all the, the difficulties with kind of getting through our daily lives and the financial struggles. It's just getting harder and harder to kind of just survive. So what can you do if you need some advice? Find a therapist, but don't settle on one. Dr. DeGain says finding a therapist is similar to dating. Give it a couple of tries, and if you don't feel comfortable... Your first therapist may not be your last therapist. When it comes to picking a therapist, Dr. DeGain says find someone who works with your schedule, finances, and most importantly, to go in with an open mind. The unknown is always scary. That's what kind of makes it that in the first place, but growth is also part of the unknown, and you won't really know until you try. People here in Texas are looking for help. San Antonio ranks 28th out of the top 30 cities with people interested in getting into therapy. Austin, Fort Worth, El Paso, Dallas, and Houston are also on that list. There's the political um, differences that happen even within the state. There's the kind of pushing down of mental health um, support and the, the rise of the stigma around that. On top of political differences, social media also takes a huge toll on our mental health. While it's meant to connect us, it can end up tearing people down. It also shows people's best sides. You don't see the struggles they're going through, how difficult things are, how long it takes to get certain progress. You just see the end results and you start comparing to the best and it makes it really difficult to understand the humanness of everyone else. Self-care is also important for your mental health. So put down your phone, get outside, see family and friends, and don't be afraid to get help. Haley Powers, KSAT 12 News. Okay, the number is eight. <laughs> eight days till the eclipse. And we were just talking about this. Eight days seems like a short amount of time, right. but weather-wise, there's you can't, it's too soon it's, to know. It's too soon okay. to go all in 100% on cloud okay. cover right. when it comes to an hour-by-hour hour forecast. So, yes, early guidance does suggest that there could be some clouds out there. That's what our forecast currently mm -hmm. calls for. But, yes, a lot can change in the upcoming weeks. So and there can be some clouds. Right. And still we'll just, be able to see right. it. Right. So, right. yeah, it's just too soon for hour-by-hour hour details and specifics when it comes to the cloud cover forecast. Next Monday, April 8th, when the total solar eclipse takes shape in the south central Texas sky, my best advice right now would just be to check back multiple times over the course of the upcoming week as we really start to hone in on what that forecast looks like for next Monday. But I also bring this up because we have several days where we are going to be giving eclipse glasses away, your weather authority eclipse glasses. The next one is on Tuesday, April 2nd. Line starts around 5, hand out around 6.30. Adam Kasky's going to be out at that location right there, 8622 Hebner Road with Tacos Norteño, and it's going to be a lot of fun. We had a glasses giveaway last week, Spivey and I did, and we had a great time. And so we have more of those upcoming this week. So just keep an eye out on social media, and we'll definitely let you know when and where all of those are taking place. Place. All right, now that we are wrapping up the month of March, if you can believe it, and turning the page of the calendar into the month of April, I did want to give you a recap for how we measured up here in the Alamo City. Our rainfall total. 0.88, so under about nine tenths of an inch, which is almost an inch and a half below the average for the month of March. Thankfully, we did see some beneficial rains in late January that's still keeping us ahead in the rainfall department when it comes to those totals since the beginning of the year. In terms of your temperatures, the hottest high that we saw was March 5th. We reached 91 degrees. The coldest low was 41 on March 10th. But all things considered, we were about 3.1 degrees warmer than the average for the month of March. Now, as we look ahead to the upcoming month of April, tomorrow, your average high, 78. Average low is 55. But take a look at the end of the month. Yes, spring-like temperatures. We continue to warm things up. That average high jumps to 83. And the average low, a little bit more on the muggy side in the low 60s. We do have some cooler mornings on tap this week, especially by Wednesday. Check out 
at the afternoons. Yes, hotter than average tomorrow, nearing 90 degrees. But after we see that cold front move in tomorrow night and early Tuesday, we're back down closer to seasonable near the average 80 degrees on Tuesday and then 70s expected by the middle of the week and even into the Thursday and Friday time frame. The kicker is going to be that drier air as well. That's going to make it more comfortable and very pleasant to be outside in. But before we can get there, we've got the humidity in place tonight and that is going to allow for yet another round of some patchy morning fog and some mist to develop by the time a lot of us are stepping out for the Monday morning drive. So as we mentioned a little bit earlier, a good idea to give yourself just a little bit of extra time out the door to get to where you need to be because of that. That does look to clear on out of here by mid to late morning, but the cloud cover is going to hold on for the most part throughout the day. Mostly cloudy skies into the afternoon temperatures, though upper 80s near that 90 degree mark. And of course, we will still be monitoring after 9 p.m. for the tail end of this broken line of rain and thunderstorms to push across south central Texas, moving in from the west and pushing farther off to the east late tomorrow night. And as we sleep into the early morning hours of our Tuesday, it clears the area by sunrise. We will see a little bit of a breeze on Tuesday. Wind gusts out of the north gusting upwards of 25 to maybe even 30 <laughs> miles per hour. But that drier air is going to make for some cool mornings pleasant out there by Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Yes, you'll want the extra layer in the mornings, but you're not going to need it into the afternoons comfortable. Then we'll start to see the humidity return as well as some additional cloud cover into next weekend. The 90 scared me, but I like the rest of it. I just said we got to get over it once again. <laughs> just got to get over tomorrow, then we'll be all right. All right. Thanks, Mia. OK, every weekend in March, a sequel or franchise has topped the box office. And the final weekend of the month was no different. The early estimates for the top five films and theaters ahead on the night beat. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The religious horror movie Immaculate fell to fifth place with $3.3 million. Kung Fu Panda 4 took fourth on ticket sales of $10.2 million for a domestic total of $152 million. Dune Part 2 is at $252 million domestic after a third place weekend worth $11.1 million. If there's something strange in the neighborhood, who are they going to call? Ghostbusters Frozen Empire dropped 65% in its sophomore weekend, earning $15.7 million, good enough for second place. Hey, what are you telling? Godzilla Kong The New Empire exceeded expectations in its opening weekend, roaring to the top with $80 million. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. Well, the shorthanded San Antonio Spurs were at home tonight looking to extend their season high three game winning streak against the Golden State Warriors. Mary Rominger is in here in the studio to preview instant replay. There was no Jeremy Sohan, right. no Keldon Johnson, no Devin Vassell. So Victor Wembanyama had his hands full tonight against the Golden State Warriors coming up tonight on instant replay. Curry over Wemby. Green the rebound, kicks it back out, Thompson for three. Kill it. It was a one possession game with under a minute to play, but the Spurs couldn't climb all the way back. After trailing by as many as 13 points, Golden State steals the win in San Antonio, and the Spurs' three game winning streak comes to an end. How are the Spurs doing lately in crunch time? Nick Mantis and I will break that down. This goes far, this ball through and in! There's the go ahead goal, striking late once again. Kevon Lambert's go ahead goal in the 86th minute lifted San Antonio FC 2 to 1 over Monterey Bay FC. SAFC remains undefeated four games into the season. Now they get ready to play three of their next four games on the road. Also, the San Antonio Brahmas kicked off the 2024 UFL season with a bang, taking down the D.C. defenders. We're also talking March Madness games, Major League Baseball, and Zeke returning to Dallas potentially. That and much more. It's all coming your way on Instant Replay at 11 o'clock. The Brahmas players are not messing around. No, they are not. They're hyped up. Yes. I love <laughs> to see it. All right. Thanks, Mary. We'll be right back.